There is a instinct to help people and protect people that overrides the logic of saying this is a thankless job. It's, you know, it, it, it's kind of been thankless for a while, but it's worse in the last year and a half. I don't think at any time in my life have the police been under a microscope more than they are now. Sometimes I think very deservedly so. Sometimes I just wonder who in the world wants to be a cop these days? Well, to answer that, uh, this poor guy has, has the worst Italian name. John, I'm not even going to try it. <laughs> it's John DiGirolamo. No, it can't be. <laughs> Listen, as, as a fellow WAP, there's no G. Geronimo. There's no, and I'm, anyway, let's, let's get to this. You wrote a book called It's Not About the Badge, and it's really a collection of stories about very specific cops and what, what they've done and, and who they are. First, so, first of all, you're not a cop. Correct. Um, then why would you write a book that details the stories of a half dozen police officers to show them as very human people? You know, growing up um, and in my career, um, I didn't have a lot of interaction with the police. You know, the, before my daughter got interested in being an officer, the most interaction I had was getting a ticket on the freeway, you know, a dozen years ago. And as she got more into um, policing and wanting to do that since a high school age, I started to understand kind of what they, what they do. And, you know, last year the police were vilified by the media um, which I thought was very unfair. And, you know, you had politicians, celebrities, the media um, calling to defund the police uh, and et cetera. And I just felt like um, that really wasn't right. It wasn't good for society. And also um, that, you know, these officers, especially small, uh, small town, middle America officers, they don't get a voice in the media. And I felt like, um, it was time that I gave them a voice to tell their stories from their perspective so people could see what they, what they do every day and what they put up with and how difficult the job is because I think a lot of Americans um, were like me where they just maybe didn't have a lot of interaction with the police. And I, let, me, let me put it this way. I know that there are people who the cops can never win. You know, the cop watch and Black Lives Matter, there's really, the cops are just bad and they're systematically bad. And then I know folks whose dad was a cop, or in your case, maybe their daughter is a cop, and for the most part, cops can do no right, uh, or they can, can do no wrong. They, they, they're, you know, they're misunderstood and they work hard, and you know, next time you need one, you want one there. It's, and it seems to be, and it seems like that is pushing more and more to, the, um, to both sides. I find myself very much in the middle in that I have had plenty of encounters with police officers uh, who are just jerks and um, uh, who are on a power trip. And I can see why some people really just have a dislike for the police, uh, that they can be very authoritarian. And, um, and there are a lot of them who, who just are on a power trip. And then I run into some, some police and I, I get to know them. And those guys, it's like, wow. I can see the kind of life you have to go through and, and how awful it has to be to be a, a, a cop right now. So why do we have these two different viewpoints of, of police? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pin some of that on the media for kind of polarizing the police, um, sensationalizing a lot of the negative things, whether it's the George Floyd incident and, and others. Um, and, and I think that you just sort of see one side of it and you just get these headlines of, you know, the police are, are, are using excessive force and you don't get all the full story many of the time. People don't wait for all the facts to come out. And I can tell you after interviewing these officers, just about every one of them said that there's always some kind of drugs or alcohol involved in a, in a criminal um, uh, activity. And if somebody's on drugs or alcohol, they're very difficult to take down. They don't listen. They, you know, even with tasers and, and, and pepper spray, they're, you know, they can have what seems like super, superhuman strength. One of the stories that I have on here is a domestic violence case where that exactly what happened. It took three officers to get this guy down and um, he was high on meth and it, it just always ends badly um, and they, they don't comply. They, you know, the officer tells them what to do, 
and they don't listen, and lo and behold, it escalates and gets worse. Let's take the incident up in Loveland uh, that happened a month or two ago of um, the woman with dementia is walking alongside of the road, and uh, she's thrown down on the ground, and she's got a broken bone from it, and, and it was obvious that, um, that the police really didn't understand her mental state, and I think, from my layman's point of view, um, just completely overreacted. And there was a video of them laughing about it afterwards. It's that kind of stuff that makes people go, you know, that's, that's not right. We shouldn't be funding that activity. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be, you know, bad apples. Um, I, I, I think that the police are getting better training um, in the last decade uh, to be more on a de-escalation skills as well as to try to um, recognize when somebody has mental health issues. Um, so it's, it, it's a difficult balance. You know, this is an unfortunate incident, but I don't think it represents the average everyday interaction um, with the police. The charge right now is that law enforcement is systematically racist. And when I talk to people, my friends who are African American, they they believe that. I'm going to ask you, and you're likely going to say, no, that's completely untrue. And I'll ask, why then the misconception? So is it true? Um, I, I don't think it's true. Um, I, don't think the, I don't think the country is systematically racist either. Um, you know, there's always going to be um, people with, with racist attitudes. Um, I, I think that there's been a lot of sensa sensationalization of, of that when those seemingly racist issues come up. But unfortunately, we live in a society where race is, seems to be the first lens that you look at things through. Um, you know, I, I think the police are reacting to the situation. And, it, you know, regardless of whether the person's black, white, or brown, or, or, or whatever, um, because you're also seeing these, you know, same kind of um, instances. It's not just white officers. Um, you know, I think they're painting the whole police like that. And, and I think that's unfair, um, but you know, it, it, it's a situation that, that, that uh, feeds into the polarization of this country. Started with this question, I'm gonna go back to it. Why would anyone wanna become a cop right now? The press despises you. You've got progressives who want to defund you. You've got people spitting on you. Uh, it's uh, been calling you racist, uh, attacking your, your offices. And why would any good person want to go into that line of work? They must be having an awful time recruiting. They must be having an awful time recruiting minority officers, particularly black officers, if in fact, you know, their relatives are gonna say, no, you're just part of the racist machine, you're doing it for the man. So you've got a daughter, you're close to this, she's a cop now. What in the world drives somebody today to go do that job? What you said is very logical and makes a lot of sense. And you, my, my daughter's gonna be an officer for about four years now. And you know, I always laugh because I say, I tried to get her to be an accountant and she just wouldn't have any of that. She just despises uh, spreadsheets and uh, that kind of thing. And I thought long and hard about that because I get that question a lot. And it really comes down to that there is a instinct to help people and protect people that overrides the logic of saying this is a thankless job. It's, you know, it, it, it's kind of been thankless for a while, but it's worse in the last year and a half. Oh, let me, let me push back. No, no, John, it's not about helping people. It's about people who want to have a badge, carry a gun, have a swagger, order other people around, and have this authority that other people have to respect. They, they, they want to catch bad guys, certainly but it really is more about the lifestyle and the perceived power. Um, the officers that I interviewed, that really wasn't where they were coming from. You know, I have a lot of stories in the book where um, at a young age, they had this instinct. There, there's this one story of, of uh, Jesse Cortez as a five-year-old, sees some older kid, seven-year-old, 
bullying someone else and instinct took over and he went to go help that person um, and got in his first fight at five years old. Um, I, that, I think that's just ingrained in some people. I, I, I'm sure what you said, you know, does apply to some people, but I can tell you the officers that I interviewed, they're in it for the right reasons. And I think most are. I think some of the, the, the bad attitude ones are, are weeded out because that kind of bubbles up to the surface it's, right it's away. It's funny that you mentioned the kid at five. Uh, a couple of the guys I know, um, they got involved as kids. They became volunteers at the sheriff's office uh, in high school or even before high school. And it was something that there, there was something drawn to that mission. It wasn't, it wasn't, I want to order people around. I also asked a lot of sheriffs who have deputies. I said, what's the most dangerous time? And what do you, what do you mean? And I said, come on, you know what I'm talking about. No, you, know, you know bad cops, and you know the ones who are attitude problems, uh, and the ones you worry about. Um, you know, what's the story? And the answer I got was, usually shows up at around two years of service. Enough service under your belt that you kind of know the ropes, uh, and just enough to start getting cocky. And he, you know, I've had a couple sheriffs say, that's kind of the danger zone for uh, for our recruits, which is you know will you know what happens, and I said how do you how do you stop that? What do you do? They all say the same thing, which is it weeds them they weed themselves out. Yeah, uh, yeah. That nobody wants to be their partner. The older guys, the seasoned guys, these are guys who don't want to you know uh, get into fist fights. They don't want to uh, order people around. They want to work with people. They want to um, they want to help people. But I've got to wonder, given all the media, and it is media, is there, is there, does there need to be something more than just the social pressure inside the department to get them out? Well, I think, you know, there, there's, all the officers are, would tell you that they'd like more training, um, whether that's interacting with people, whether that's trying to assess a situation, de-escalate a situation. You know, the, the book that I wrote isn't, um, it isn't meant to just show the police as heroes. You know, there's, there's stories in there about flawed police officers. Give me, give me that story of that one. Sure. So um, w one of the stories was um, Jesse Mitchell. And I asked him when, um, when I interviewed him, and we talked about strengths and weaknesses of you as an officer. And, and, and he piped up right away and said, you know, one of the things I think I do really well is de-escalate a situation. And I said, okay, to tell me a story. Give me an example. And we, we talked about a situation where two people were highly agitated, highly emotional, and they were ready to start coming to blows. The police were called. And um, an officer kind of made an insulting comment about a woman's um, son who had just died. And this was a senior, more senior officer than, um, than Jesse. He basically took over the situation, you know, and said, well, go check with dispatch, see what's going on. And he handled these two people, tried to come up with a solution that they could work out, and, um, and, and then was able to get to that solution where everybody was happy. You know, if, if that hadn't happened, it could have got more agitated. Someone could have got arrested. This other officer landed up um, leaving the force, and so he did get weeded out. And, um, you know, I think those de-escalation skills, the media don't talk about that. Those are not the ones that land up on someone's cell phone camera. And it's an important skill to have. And I thought that was a great story of his to explain that, um, you know, and it's not a hero story. They're not going to make a movie but out it, of it's, that. It's the day-to-day -day stuff is what, what you're telling yes. me. It is the day in and day out stuff. The other thing I think we're learning as... Uh, we're seeing more and more videos, and I love uh, body cams on cops. Almost every single cop I've talked to loves their camera. I agree. And they say, this has saved my tuckus because somebody accuses us of doing this, this, and this. You know, the supervisor looks and goes, you, you know, what? Yeah, uh, the evidence that comes in when people are talking, uh, that yep. it has done more to protect cops. Um, give me, what, what story touched you the most? I mean, you've got six great interviews that really show that the police are just people like us. 
And I, I think that is a very American thing. Um, one of the beautiful parts of American law enforcement is that they don't work for a dictator. They don't work uh, for a thug. They don't work for the king. They work for the people we've elected. They are the ground troops in our, um, in our democracy. And because of that, they're among us. And that is so crucial, and I think it is unique in American history and world history that we have it. And I think it's so very important, and I think it makes them special. Uh, time we have left, give me what story touched you the most out of all your interviews? Sure. It, you know, I, I focus on small town cops, and that's great because they know the history of the town, they know a lot of the people, they know who the criminals are, but the criminals also know who they are. And one of the most intense stories that I had was where um, um, Jesse Cortez had uh, just went to give um, a woman a, an arrest warrant. Uh, she was just going to get cited. It wasn't really that big of a deal. Her son, who was a criminal, was, was wanted by the police in two different counties, um, decides to scope out his house with a 12-gauge shotgun, starts shooting at the house. Now you the can't, bad guy is the bad guy is, is stalking the cop's house. Yes, which happens more often than people realize. That doesn't get reported. Yeah, and so now you've got this officer. He can't be there twenty four seven to protect his family, and it, the story goes through. What is he thinking? You know, how does his family react? You know, the family has to be tough. They have to be aware, much more aware than the average citizen walking down the street uh, because they don't know what's going to happen. Um, is this guy going to break into the house in the middle of the night? Is he going to stalk the kids? I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen. It's the uncertainty that's really causing that um, agitation. And um, so that was a pretty intense story. It landed up that um, other officers had found out where this guy was um, living with a friend and they landed up chasing him through town on July 4th in the middle of a parade. Um, and he lands up going onto the railroad tracks and crashes. Oh. And they catch him. So, you know, it, it, it's a story that ended well, but you can imagine the emotion of worrying about your family. And the first thing you have to think of is like, why am I doing this? Yep. You know, and, and it's a tough situation. And it really takes that resilience of the officer to step back look at the big picture, look at what they really feel a calling to do. And, and that was a pretty emotional, um, intense story. Um, and, and, and we talk about who these criminals are, what, what are they doing, what mistakes are they making before the officer is even called to the scene. So I try to bring these other characters to life based upon the descriptions that, that, that the officers told me on who they were. I talked to a, a woman from a, a cop who served as a campus officer once. And he pulled over a woman for speeding, um, and she was from a South American country, and she, he let her off with a warning. And she said, so you're going to follow me home? And he didn't understand it. And then he, it hit him. She's saying, so, I get it. You're not going to arrest me or give me a ticket. In exchange, you're going to follow me home, and I have to have sex with you, and that's the way out. And it, it's, it hit him in such a way that, oh my God, what, what happens in other countries? What is the police system right. in other countries that this is considered uh, what cops do? And so the American relationship with law enforcement uh, needs to be strengthened, and, and it's crucial. Otherwise, we, we end up with a system more like that. And uh, I'm just grateful for the cops. I'm grateful for the, the six stories. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button, too. You don't want to miss a single show.